and welcome our guest of honour, Mr. S. Iswaran, Minister for the Prime Minister's Office and Second Minister for Home Affairs and Trade and Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now take your seats. Good evening, Minister Iswaran, SMU President Professor Anna Di Meyer, distinguished guests and fellow students. Welcome to the MTI Economic Dialogue 2012. My name is Nicholas Ong. I am a third year economic student from SMU and I will be your MC for this event. This year's Economic Dialogue is jointly organised by the Ministry of Trade and Industry and the Singapore Management University and is supported by the National University of Singapore and the Nanyang Technological University. This dialogue is part of the Economist Service efforts to provide a platform for undergraduates to voice out their opinions on economic issues facing Singapore. This year, the theme for the economic dialogue is Population and Economy, Choices Facing Singapore. The problem of Singapore's declining birth rates and aging population has been in the news recently, and today's discussion will centre on the economic implications of these demographic trends. Today, we are very honoured to have with us Minister Iswaran, who will share his views on this topic. Following that, we will have a panel discussion with Minister Iswaran and our two invited panellists, Mr Sanjeev Sanyal and Mr Henry Quack. Before we end today's dialogue, we will present the MTI Academic Awards and Economist Service Scholarships. After that, there will be a dinner reception over which you can mingle with the guests and the economists from the Economist Service. Let us now invite Professor Anna Di Meyer, President of SMU, to give the opening address. Professor Di Meyer, please. Our guest of honour, Mr. S. Iswaran, Minister in the Prime Minister's Office and Second Minister for Home Affairs and Trade and Industry, uh, distinguished guests, colleagues and students uh, from the three universities. Um, it's a very great honour and a pleasure, actually, for me uh, to give here tonight the opening address for this year's MTI Economic Di Dialogue and to welcome all participants to SMU. Uh, I understand that the MTI dialogue, Economic Dialogue was started in 2008 by the Ministry of Trade and Industry as a platform for students to gain insights into pertinent economic issues and challenges facing in Singapore. It also provides them the opportunity to analyze and gain a greater appreciation of the role played by the discipline of economics in policy making. Now, I'm not going to steal the show here, but I sort of dotted down a few points that I thought that I observed basically about what's going on in Singapore. And uh, I know that all of us present here know that Singapore is one of the most open and competitive markets in the world. Uh, you see these rankings. Uh, and Singapore is ranked number one in the most recent World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index, along with Hong Kong and New Zealand. And in the 2012 World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report, Singapore was, uh, rose one place to the second spot, having overtaken Sweden, which is ranked third. So clearly indications of an open and competitive economy. As an academic, I don't believe too much in small shifts in rankings or precise, the precise ranking itself. But the fact that Singapore is and remains in the top five of the world is a tribute to your competitiveness. Now, we all remember that after a bad year in 2009, and actually also in 2008, Singapore's economy was in 2010 one of the fastest growing economies in the world, with a real GDP growth of 14.8%. Now, even though our growth rate has slowed down uh, to 4.9% in 2011 as a result of the global recession, it still outperformed the other advanced industrialized economies. And although growth in 2012 is expected to be around 3%, with a modest pickup to around 3.5% in 2013, as predicted, Singapore still has a substantial current account surplus, which is expected to remain above 20% of its GDP, all seemingly pretty good numbers. Nevertheless, as in the, in the case of all first world economies, Singapore has its fair share of challenges. And 
it's not a place here for me to go through the total list. In fact, there are many better economists in the room, and I'm simply an engineer. So, uh, but I'll pick a few of them that I find quite interesting. First of and foremost, it's clear that inflation poses a challenge to Singapore with its pressure from tighter labor markets, higher transportation costs, credit growth, and asset prices. Secondly, as a small and open economy, which is one of the strengths of Singapore, it is also a weakness in the sense that it's not immune to global weaknesses. With the Eurozone crisis, the ever-continuing Eurozone crisis, the slower US re recovery, and perhaps a China that is growing slower than expected, the economic prospects for Singapore in the next half year or more will be indeed somewhat challenging. For those of you who will be entering the labor market, you might have to adjust your, your expectations a little bit in view of the impending economic situation. And I must say that this is exacerbated by the fact that the upcoming elections in several European countries and in the United States, as well as the leadership change in China, may slow down the policy changes needed to respond to the economic difficulties. Or it may be even bring in teams like we've seen in France, which are inexperienced and need to go through a learning period. Third point that I just pick up is that the expected slowdown of the economy, global economy comes at a, tame, a time sorry, when domestic inflation rates is also high by historical standards in Singapore for reasons very specific to Singapore's situation and the recent political choices of which we probably will discuss a few later on. And fourth point is that I think, and I have shared this with many people, that Singapore needs and can invest significantly in productivity improvement. improvement. It still ranks relatively low in total factor productivity, and a casual observation suggests there are huge improvements to be realized in the service sector in Singapore. Now, these are the type of challenges, and I just give sort of at random four that I picked up. But these are the changes of challenge, challenges that pose a real dilemma to policymakers when they are implementing economic policy. And I have sort of given here three or four challenges that I see uh, responding to these uh, issues that you see in the environment. For example, should the Monetary Authority of Singapore adopt a policy of strengthening the Singapore dollar to fight inflation? But at the same time, could it weaken Singapore's international competitiveness? Or should MAS adopt a policy of weakening the Singapore dollar to allow exports and trade to grow, so that they could, uh, which, but this could also cause domestic inflation to escalate? And we all know that there is an economic dilemma that is faced by policymakers in several countries. I actually read today that also that is a big deal in Thailand for the moment. Uh, so we see that it's not only a dilemma for Singapore, but also in other countries. Another issue for policymakers is how to react to that expected slowdown that I was talking about, global slowdown. Singapore's development strategy has placed it in a stronger position than most to absorb the decline in global growth. Singapore's economic, economic resilience in the face of global financial crises is particularly notable in that Singapore is a resource-poor country with a relatively small domestic market. It has compensated for this by opening up to external markets, developing domestic industries responsive to global needs, and investing in human capital development. This includes a high quality education system producing graduates, of whom I have quite a few here in front of me, who not only have the skills necessary to support key industries, but also are able to take advantage of the benefits of globalization. Now, interesting enough, this combination of measures has worked well in 2008 and 2009. But will it be sufficient for the extended slowdown that some economists expect to last till 2020? A third point, or a, sort of an, an economic dilemma, is the main theme of this year's dialogue in Mr. Minister Iswaran's keynote address on population and economy. Choices facing Singapore is another um, sort of population economy choices facing Singapore is another very challenging area where policy needs to be developed. Now, the good news is that we see these challenges in the, in, uh, in the, in the economy. We see that that leads to policies, choices, and dilemmas that need to be solved, where we as academics hope 
uh, to make a contribution is that actually through research we can actually fuel the debate, we can actually inform uh, the decision making. And I'll take two examples, but research at our School of Economics and also at our School of Social Sciences can hopefully inform policy making. International trade, for example, is one of our SMU's strong footholds. Our international trade group is consistently publishing first-rate research in top journals and can hopefully bring in some insight in how to position Singapore in the global economy. Secondly, uh, SMU's research in financial econometrics has produced an early detection system for asset price bubbles and has created two indices for Singapore, namely the Inflation Expectations Index and the Corporate Governance Index. Asset bubbles and inflation are very important issues and SMU research is hopefully a valuable resource to central banks, not only in Singapore but around the world in their policy setting. So you see that research can contribute to inform uh, policy making, research can contribute to help solve the dilemmas that I was referring to. But also students can contribute to the reflection on these issues. In fact, uh, I think that being a student in economics today is a great, great uh, advantage. Uh, a few years ago, I, thought, I think it was far less exciting because then we thought we knew everything. Since 2008, we know that economists know very little. In other words, there is still a lot to be done. Uh, and students can contribute, as I said, to the reflection on these issues. Therefore, it's heartening to know that the top economic students from the three local universities will be recognized for their academic achievements and presented with, later on with the MTI Academic Awards, as I said later this evening. And the best third year economic students from NUS, NTU, and SMU will be presented the MTI Book Prize while the students from each university with the best economics thesis will be presented with the best economics thesis award. It's great to see that your thinking is rewarded. With that, I would like to wish you all a stimulating and a fruitful evening, and I'm looking forward to the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Demeyer. Let us now invite Minister Iswaran on stage to deliver his keynote address, Population and Economy, Choices Facing Singapore. Minister, please. Professor Arnold de Meyer, President of Singapore Management University, faculty and students from SMU, NTU, NUS, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good evening to all of you. I want to thank Arnold for taking us through a very quick fire coverage of broad issues that we face in Singapore. Um, he was rather modest in saying he's just an engineer. I wanted to share one more bit of information which I think you should use as you see fit. His area of specialization was in nuclear engineering. I'm very pleased to join all of you today at the fifth MTI Economic Dialogue. And let me start by congratulating and commending the thesis and economics book prize winners on their research and the excellence in studies. First, to congratulate the very inaugural batch of economic service scholars. The Economic Service Scholarship is awarded to students who have demonstrated the aptitude and the interest in being public sector economists. In particular, I want to congratulate Jeanette Pang, who will be pursuing her studies at the University of Warwick, Wen Chia Ying, who will be heading to the London School of Economics, and Afika Binti Suhaimi, who will be at the National University of Singapore. We wish them all the best and look forward to their future contributions to public policy, which, as you can well appreciate, is one that is going to be filled with many challenges. Let me now turn to a topical and pertinent issue of the day, demographic shifts we will witness over the next 20 years, its economic implications, and the policy choices it entails for all of us. We face three demographic trends in the medium term. First, our local workforce will shrink. As you would be aware, our total fertility rate has been below the replacement rate since 1976. Hence, the local workforce will begin to shrink in eight years' time as our baby boomers 
begin to retire and fewer young Singaporeans enter the workforce. Second, our workforce will age. Between 2011 and 2030, the median age of Singaporeans in the workforce will rise from 39 years to 47 years. An older workforce brings with it experience and networks that companies must learn to make the most of. But equally, older workers will have to adapt to new technologies and sustain innovation. And the government and employers will need to help workers retrain and upgrade themselves. Third, Singaporeans will be more highly educated in future. The government has announced quite recently plans to expand university places and by 2020, 40% of each cohort will enter university, up from 27% today. While more Singaporeans will be able to realize their educational aspirations, we need to ensure that our economy and businesses continue to thrive and create correspondingly good jobs for them. Our people are our key to growth. And these trends mean that growth will be even more difficult to achieve in future from Singapore's perspective. However, to meet the rising aspirations of present and future generations of Singaporeans, we will need growth, not as an end in itself, but rather as a means to generate the opportunities which growth heralds. In a growing economy, businesses thrive, new and diverse industries are created, and they result in jobs that can meet the wide range of interests and capabilities of tomorrow's Singaporeans. If opportunities dwindle, the consequences can be quite austere. Talented and skilled Singaporeans are mobile. Some will almost certainly seek out opportunities in more vibrant economies and cities. This will not only be in traditional hubs in the West, but also in up and coming cities in Asia and other fast growing regions of the world. A loss of local talent also means a loss of opportunities they could have helped us create. Two examples come to mind, Japan and Taiwan. Once lauded as an economic miracle, Japan only managed to grow its economy by 0.7% annually from 2000 to 2010. The lack of job prospects has driven its pool of highly skilled engineers to emigrate. Neighboring countries like South Korea have welcomed Japanese engineers with open arms and generous pay packages. Taiwan, too, saw economic growth slow from 6.2% annually in the 90s to 3.9% in the past decade or so. As a result, wage growth slowed significantly. Taiwan's inability to remunerate local talent competitively has resulted in a significant brain drain, and their leaders are now putting in place policies to remedy this. The impact of such shifts and trends is perhaps most deleterious on the lower skilled, who are also the least mobile. Lower or worse, no growth means fewer resources to address the needs of those with low incomes and less fiscal capacity for essential public services such as healthcare and physical infrastructure. The recent recession in many countries has shown that without economic growth, redistribution programs can quickly become unsustainable. While redistribution is undoubtedly important to address the needs of certain segments of our society, it essentially reallocates the wealth generated by economic growth. Ultimately, we still need to be able to grow the pie for redistribution, and that is the only way redistribution policies can be sustainable. Growth begets opportunities which generate these resources. 
and to fuel growth we will need to address our demographic challenges. There is no single solution to these challenges. And while we may not have all the answers, one thing is clear. The solution entails both locals and foreigners playing a role in our economy. Apart from raising our fertility rate, there are broadly three approaches we can take. First, we can make the most of our own Singaporean core by raising our labor force participation rate. There is more that we can do to help certain groups, such as stay-at-home mums, older workers and retirees, in order that they can enter or re-enter the workforce. The Ministry of Manpower is doing a significant amount of work on this front. For instance, by encouraging flexible work arrangements and introducing the Retirement and Re-Employment Act, important microeconomic initiatives to achieve macroeconomic outcomes. Companies, too, must play their part through enlightened HR policies that allow individuals to balance their work, personal responsibilities, and family commitments. Second, and this is something that we're all familiar with, we must boost productivity so that our labor force works smarter. Again, this is self-evident. In this regard, the National Productivity and Continuing Education Council has implemented and supported various policies and schemes to address sector-specific productivity issues. For firms, the Productivity and Innovation Credit provides tax rebates for expenditure on machinery, training, and other productivity-related measures. We have also raised the foreign worker levy and tightened the number of foreign workers firms can hire. This motivates firms to enhance the efficiency of their processes and to lessen their reliance on foreign manpower and labor-intensive methods. Both older and younger workers will have new avenues to enhance their productivity. By next year, two training campuses will be set up as hubs, where integrated career coaching can be conducted by clusters of trainers. Adapting to an older workforce requires some mind sh mindset shifts in the short run. But firms that can leverage on the strengths of older workers will certainly gain over the longer term. And this includes efforts at job redesign and instituting flexible work or part-time work arrangements. Several local companies have endeavored in this direction, and they are beginning to see significant outcomes, which I think will sustain their longer-term business strategies. While raising labor force participation rate and productivity are important, there are limits to these efforts. Singapore already has a high resident labor force participation rate at 66%, higher than comparable figures amongst OECD countries. Boosting the labor force participation rate by 1% adds about 30,000 resident workers to our labor force of around 3 million. Furthermore, it took two decades to improve labor force participation rate by three percentage points. So the gains on this front will take time. Productivity growth will also be hard won. We are aiming for 2 to 3 percent productivity growth annually, which is an ambition tar ambitious target given international experience and our own average annual productivity growth of 1.8 percent from 2000 to 2010. Given the limits of these two approaches, a third thrust would be to judiciously employ foreign manpower to the benefit of our economy and, of course, for Singaporeans. And this hinges on the role that foreign manpower plays in supporting our local workforce. Foreign workers are important in sectors which serve crucial social needs in Singapore. And some of these, or the jobs in these sectors, may not appeal to Singaporeans. One example is the construction sector which is essential for our houses, factories, roads, and other critical infrastructure. 
Another is healthcare services where frontline integrated care workers or allied health professionals render much needed services to our ill and our aged. As a small open economy, Singapore's growth is highly dependent on external opportunities which ebb and flow. We must therefore also have the flexibility to take advantage when opportunity presents itself by tapping on higher skilled foreign workers to complement our local core so as to anchor promising new industries in Singapore. As more Singaporeans upgrade or acquire the requisite skills, we will be able to strengthen the local core in these new sectors. And this has been our experience in, for example, the interactive digital media sector. And indeed, we can think of many others in the same frame of mind. Our aim in this endeavor is twofold. First, a judicious augmentation of our local workforce with foreign manpower in order to fuel growth and opportunities for Singaporeans. And on the other hand, a systematic effort to strengthen the local core through education and skills upgrading so that more Singaporeans can benefit from the jobs that are being created. We must be cognizant of the fact that if we crimp too hard on access to foreign manpower, growth and opportunities will diminish. If we are too liberal, firms may become less productive and indeed over-reliant on low-cost foreign manpower. Hence, our manpower policies need to be balanced and flexible to respond to shifting trends. And this must be complemented with the requisite investment in essential infrastructure, such as housing and transport. So let me sum up the perspectives that I've tried to share with you today. We will have to ensure that Singapore remains a choice home that meets the aspirations of Singaporeans as a place to work and as a place to live and raise a family. Competition for talent will intensify and we need to ensure that Singapore remains economically vibrant to continue growing our economy so as to create opportunities for Singaporeans to enjoy better living standards. We all have a role in shaping the development of our economy over the next 20 years. And this dialogue is an important setting for that as much as any other conversation and effort we undertake. Singaporeans must be ready to learn new skills and adapt to new processes, while foreign workers continue to play a complementary role. Businesses should enhance their productivity, leverage on the experience of our older workers, and adopt flexible work practices so that more women, older workers, can enter the workforce. The government will support this through appropriate policies and by seeking to forge a broad national consensus on the path forward. Only then can we truly hope that Singapore remains an attractive and vibrant place for this and future generations of Singaporeans. Thank you for inviting me and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you.